Welcome to Outside Sales Talk, where we meet with industry experts to learn the strategies and tactics that make them successful. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and I've helped thousands of salespeople all over the world crush their quota. Today, I'll help you crush yours. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, we have uh, Terry Hansen on the show. We're going to be talking about how to close larger sales. Welcome to the show, Terry. Hey, super good to be with you. Thanks for the invitation to be here and uh, sure appreciate all that you're doing for your listeners and hope we can create some good value for them today. So, Fantastic. So uh, by way of introduction, uh, Terry is the president of the Hansen Group and has been helping organizations increase their sales success for over a decade. His strategies for improving sales performance have been used by organizations in many B2B industries. As a keynote speaker and workshop presenter, he conducts hundreds of presentations each year for businesses all over the country. And I, uh, I just learned that he's a chocolate milk lover. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Dyed in the wool, true blue. Outstanding. Well, uh, who doesn't like chocolate milk? I mean, it's genius. You take milk and you add chocolate. I love well, it. Well, part, part of the problem, frankly, is I live in the state of Idaho. And as everybody knows, Idaho is really famous for potatoes. Mm -hmm. and man, we've, we've got this dairy, this, uh, you know, dairy here locally called Reed's Dairy. And these evil practitioners, what they actually do is they put potato flakes, dehydrated potato flakes in their rich, creamy chocolate milk to make it just that much more rich and creamy. And oh, wow. it is decadent and uh, it is the most wonderful thing in the world. <laughs> that and, is and so messed up. <laughs> not, not to, I know it's a, it's a little crazy, not to belabor it, but one of my favorite treats there is they actually put, you know what a root beer float is? Uh -huh, actually uh -huh. put, uh, uh, either chocolate or vanilla ice cream in a cup and then pour the chocolate milk uh, on top of that, like a root beer float. They call it the brown cow. And, right, uh, right. Well, it's, it's about, like an unwhipped milkshake. Yeah, it's uh, it's only about a thousand calories. Uh, anyways, it's wonderful. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. Well, let's jump into it. Um, so to start out, you, you mentioned exceeding customer expectations. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the methodology of under-promise and over-deliver? Uh, well, good. I mean, good question. Gosh, the, uh, you know, our, 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 our prospects or our, our customers expectations are something that we, I think as salespeople got to, got to pay a little bit more attention to than we, uh, maybe than we have in the past. I think we kind of gloss over those and take those for granted when we are first meeting with them for the very first time. I think it's smart for us to ask ourselves, what are they assuming or expecting out of me? What are they expecting out of our conversation? And, uh, and, and in terms of how the conversation might end, what are, what are they expecting? And what I've noticed over the years is, is our, our prospects and our clients, their expectations are, are pretty fluid. They're very moldable and shapeable, right? And so one of the best ways that we can ensure that we not only meet and exceed their expectations, but uh, but uh, not only meet them but exceed them is to to educate them and teach them. Uh, but ultimately, we've got to we've got to help teach them about what's most important to them. You'd be surprised. Most business owners, directors, VPs, executives, etc. They don't they don't necessarily know everything about everything. They they just like you and me. They get a little myopic in their worlds, focusing on running their businesses, and sometimes they forget to see the kind of bigger picture. And so we can, we can create a lot of value for them by helping them see clearly things that they can't see or things that maybe they're underappreciating. And when we help align their expectations around those things, uh, man, we, we, we've done a really great job of not only setting correct expectations with them, but then setting ourselves up to, uh, uh, to not only meet them, but, but, um, you know, overachieve in that area, exceed them. So anyway, some thoughts there. Yeah, for sure. Well, and is there a risk that if you, um, if you under promise and over deliver in the act of under promising, could that be off putting to customers? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I, you know, I, we hear that all the time, you know, oh, the danger of over promising and then under delivering I, I, that's, that's pretty, pretty common. Uh, but I'm, I'm by no means a fan of 
under promising and then and then magically trying to over deliver them to try to to, to try to impress them and, and really build some value. That's, I think, the wrong way to think about this. Mm-hmm. I think the right way to think about this is, is understanding where you can really make a difference. Where can you significantly create value for this company, this organization, this person that you're selling to? And that, 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 that always, always, always goes back to the kinds of questions that you're asking what you're, how you're shaping their expectations and where you're, where you're helping them focus their attention. So uh, in terms of really creating value and, and exceeding expectations, we've just got to focus on what's most important to them and what's really going to create value. So I, uh, that's the right perspective, not the should I overpromise or underpromise in order mm-hmm. to make sure I'm safe. I, Kind of wrong. Right, so, so maybe we should we should uh, amend the classic wisdom under promise and over deliver and change it to uh, figure out where you can deliver a ton of value and then accurately promise around that area. Yeah, build their expectations around that and then crush it. You know, just really knock it out of the park. Okay, That's- fantastic. Well, we we've changed uh, conventional wisdom here, which is always good. <laughs> Well, all that in one day, it's not even, well, we could probably wrap up now. and go. Yeah, let's just go uh, get you it's your time. Um, it's, uh, it's five o'clock somewhere. Yeah, right. Well, what are, the, uh, what are the main reasons why sales don't close quickly or at all? Well, there's only 101 reasons why sales uh, don't close and, uh, or why, why maybe the sale drags on for weeks and weeks, months and months, longer than it should. Uh, there's, there's really a lot of reasons, but I guess, I guess one of the main things that I'm seeing a lot of today is I, as I work with sales organizations all around the country, one, one thing, there's kind of a common theme that I keep seeing a lot of, and that is, uh, there's a difference between how a buyer buys and their buying process versus how you and I as sellers, how, how we sell, there's a selling process and a buying process. And if you think about those two, I think one of the reasons why sales don't close and sometimes just don't close very quickly is because how buyers, we as salespeople sometimes manufacture our own reality of how, how things should be. And we, we don't consider how, how our, our, our prospects want to buy. There's, there's really kind of three stages of the buying process. They have to first identify a problem that's worth solving. They have to believe in it. And then everybody else, all their other stakeholders and decision makers have to kind of nod their head and say, yeah, that's, that's something that we feel like is really important that needs to be solved. That's kind of the first stage. And if a buyer can't hit that stage or get past that stage, we're, we're in trouble. Uh, second stage is they have to identify and feel very confident in that, there's, that they've, they've found a solution out of all the options out there a solution that's gonna that's really gonna fix that problem, and then get ever all the other stakeholders in the company to say, yeah, 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 we all love that particular solution, and so that's kind of the second stage. The third and final stage is okay. Now that we now that we've got a great problem that we know needs to be solved, and we found the right solution for who's gonna f- supply that? Which kind of vendor or, or salesperson should we talk to? Which of the millions of companies out there should we focus on? That's the buying process, problem, solution, then supplier, vendor, right? But sometimes salespeople don't sell that way. They don't put the problem identification first, the solution um, identification second, and then the vendor identification third. Sometimes us as sellers, we put the vendor piece first. Here's why our company is the best thing next to sliced bread, blah, blah, blah. Uh, oh, and here's here's our solution. Here's what we offer. Sometimes we rush to preach the word about how great our product is or how great our company is and try to get their interest that way, and, and we miss it. And so I, I think that's one of the main reasons why sales don't close at all and or they just take a long time is because all, sometimes our sales process is not aligned with how buyers buy. Does that make sense? I don't know if that uh, if the two processes and systems there – uh, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. Makes sense, but when they're yeah. aligned, gosh, when they're aligned, the the sales go well. Uh, but when they're out of whack, uh, you know, that's why God invented chiropractors, right? To put things back in alignment. Well, <laughs> kind of that's kind of our job as sales coaches, trainers, facilitators, you know, improvement experts is is to make sure that those two 
systems processes are are equally aligned so that you know they do close quick so anyway yeah well it makes sense why why don't why don't sales close quickly because buying processes and and uh, selling processes are are not in alignment well if you if you're a sales rep how can you identify warning signs that you're starting to lose your prospects attention because you're out of alignment before it's too late well, I mean, as, as we all know, there's different stages of the sales process. I mean, early on, there's kind of the prospecting side where you're just trying to find your people and get an appointment scheduled with them. So there's, I mean, that, that sort of thing could happen there at that stage. Um, during the selling process where you're going through the needs analysis or the discovery stage, trying to figure out what they need, it can happen there too. Uh, it can also happen in the presentation stage where you're going over your proposal or you're doing your demo or or that sort of thing can happen there. And then obviously trying to close the sale. So it can happen there. But I think um, some of the warning signs in the prospecting stage would be as if the, if your lead or your, your prospect, if they interrupt you or cut you off uh, early, or if they are kind of pushing you off uh, or ignoring you or just kind of showing a little a low interest at that early stage, it really means you're, you're either, you're, you're focusing on the wrong topic you're not focusing quite on the right pain points that resonate with them. That's why they're not interested. They're just not that into you. Uh, or, uh, or, or you're coming across as salesy. Mm -hmm. You're still kind of like that traditional salesy approach that causes them to get all uh, goofballish and, and defensive and nervous about talking to a salesperson. Sure. So those are some quick warning signs at the prospecting stage. But at the, at the qualification stage, when you're, you've kind of got that first meeting, you're sitting down with them for the first time, I think another warning sign is their degree of openness. How, how much are they sharing with you? Are they kind of tight lipped and giving you quick one answer, uh, short answers to your questions, or are they kind of giving you the paragraph? So their degree of openness, I think is a warning sign of, of, uh, of whether or not you have their, their attention or not, but also how much access you have to other stakeholders and decision makers in the company. If they're open and giving you plenty of access, good sign. If they're like, no, no, you just need to deal with me. That's maybe another warning sign that, you know, they're just not that into the conversation or if they were, then they'd open the doors for you. Um, I think during the presentation and closing stages, I think the hallmarks, the warning signs to be watchful for there is when the prospect that you're working with, if they're, if they're making and keeping commitments, that's a telltale sign. If they're doing it, you're in the gold zone there. But if they're, if they're not making commitments to you and if they're not keeping their commitments that they make to you, that's a massive warning sign that you, they're not, they're, they're, they fell behind. They, you don't have their attention. They're not into it. They're not committed. They're not motivated. They're not, they're not with you. So anyway, that making and keeping commitments element in the advanced stages of the process, I think is a, a key warning sign. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, that, that makes excellent sense. So let's uh, shift to one of my favorite topics, objections. What are your thoughts on overcoming buyer objections? Do you have a framework for overcoming objections? Well, um, f first off, I'm, I, I'm terrible at overcoming objections. Here I am, I coach and teach all this stuff, but I myself am terrible at overcoming objections. I like, I, I suck at it. Um, <laughs> but but what, I, what I'm pretty dang good at is actually preventing objections in the first place. And I, <laughs> the, the thought that comes, there's kind of this, this proactive approach to overcoming objections, and then there's a reactive approach to it. The, the proactive approach is, is prevention. Uh, the reactive is now that I've got the objection, oh crap, what do I do with it now? Right. And I kind of liken that to, you know, if Steve, if you and I were on the battlefield and we had to go, you know, 800 yards or something across a minefield, we know landmines are out there. What's the better stance for us to get our technology out and scan the battlefield to find out where the landmines are and then as we approach one, go ahead and deactivate it, you know, uh, or just kind of take our chances, hope for the best, walk across. And when a land, when we step on a landmine and it blows up, then try to figure out, okay, well, how do I put my leg back on? Or, you know, how do we recover from this? 
Okay, so what are some of the methods that you use to uh, <laughs> to prevent buyer objections in the first place to uh, keep you keep us from stepping on landmines? Yeah, and, and that really does go uh, because when do we run into these objections in the first place? It's usually what at, at the end of the process, like when we're trying to close the sale. This is when all the objections and worries and concerns and fears start coming out. Well, if we're just hearing about these concerns and worries and objections, like at that time, it's kind of the equivalent of having already stepped on the landmine. It's like, all right, right. now mm -hmm. we're in trouble. So if we're going to prevent all that stuff, it kind of presupposes that we should march backwards in time and go to some earlier stages in the sale process and say, what can we do early then to prevent all this stuff from erupting at the end? And, and so that's where a, a lot of times uh, people will ask, oh, just like you did, how do I prevent these objections from popping up in the in the first place and that in my mind really is the first effort that's what we should be doing first and if that doesn't work then we can always have a backup plan of trying to overcome them and resolve them once they blow up in our face but um i think the uh, the the framework that i i really uh i really like is in the discovery stage after we've got our first meeting with our prospect we're sitting down with them really for the first time and we're meeting all the people and we're just hearing one uh, hearing from them. I think it's smart for salespeople to have some criteria in their mind and hold fast to that. Uh, for example, how do they know like a weekly qualified prospect from a like a well-qualified prospect? What are the criteria there? Then use that criteria as the, a kind of a qualification matrix. And, and I've got mine that I've developed over the years. I use the acronym PIMAT. Uh, P I M A T, uh, P I M A T, PIMAT. It stands for problem, impact, money, authority, and technical. And those five topics, that five letter acronym represent these five topics that, that I use as a framework to really prevent all these objections from blowing up in my face at the end of the sales proce uh, process. So um, uh, you want to take a quick minute and kind of go through that, that framework or do yeah, we have time? Yeah, that, yeah we have time. That, that, this is really interesting. Okay. Okay. Well, so P obviously stands for problem, meaning you and I have got to get, do a good job at asking our prospects questions that help them share with us, not one issue, challenge or problem that they're facing in their business, but like three to five, like a lot. And, and once we, you know, think of a pogo stick versus a, a four-legged dining room chair. Which one's more stable and solid? Obviously, a four-legged dining room chair. Which one would you rather have four problems to solve for an organization or have to hang your hat on one problem and hope it's, you know, urgent enough that, it's, that they're going to, you know, going to have enough buying motivation around that? So we ask enough good questions to identify three to five good uh, issues, challenges, and problems that the company is dealing with. That's kind of stage one. Um, and, and if they can't come up with enough of those problems, then I know I've got a problem. Uh, I, 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 it's probably not gonna, they're probably not going to have enough urgency, uh, desire, motivation, intensity of, of need to f fix those problems to, to merit closing the sale in the first place. So that's kind of my first criteria. If I can't identify three to five good beefy problems that need to be solved. I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to run into trouble later on. The I in PIMAT, as I mentioned, stands for impact. Um, I think Neil, Neil Rackham in his 1988 spin selling book kind of pioneered this idea of asking implication or impact questions to determine what are the negative consequences and repercussions that these problems are having. How much money is it costing you? How much time is it costing you? How much emotional stress and anxiety uh, is it cost? Are these problems costing you? But asking additional questions that help the prospect, you know, share that that realm of stuff goes a long way at taking small problems and turning them into big problems. And you and I, as salespeople, quickly get a sense for how big that problem is. Again, if it's a big problem, good chance that we're not going to run into a lot of objections at the end small problem, we're probably going to, we're probably going to get a lot of pushback at the end. So uh, big problems never cause problems, but little problems always do. Um, 
uh, the M in PIMAT stands for money. And now this is a very common concept. As salespeople, we've got to take time up front to ask about our prospects' financial uh, budgets, their financial parameters, meaning how much are they willing to invest to solve the problems they just got done telling us about. You know, if they've got money, great. If they don't, well, you know, but we need to know what their, what those ranges and those budget ranges are before we give them a proposal. Otherwise we're, you know, they're going to give us all the money objections later on. So it's kind of no before you propose type. The, uh, the A in PIMAT stands for authority. And this is kind of the decision making component. Who are all the stakeholders that are involved? Uh, what's their time frame for making a decision? Um, what kind of criteria do they go through when they're making buying decisions? Uh, what's, what's, what's their process that they use when they're making buying decisions? So uh, the A for uh, PIMAT is authority, and it kind of covers all that stuff. Because as we know, some of, the, some, of the, uh, some of the objections that we get later on have to do with, well, let me talk it over with my business partner, and uh, we'll let you know. Or, um, you know, this is great. We love what you do. And um, we're not going to get started right now during the fourth quarter, but let's, uh, let's look at that during the third quarter next year. Uh, but that's the junk that we should have known like way, 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 way in advance. So we, we should never be surprised by who's involved or who hasn't weighed in or when they're timing for getting started. That, we, that should never be a surprise to us. We should know that stuff well in advance. Mm -hmm. So that's why the A in PIMAT is so important. Last one is the T, and that stands for technical. Uh, technical is, is basically how you and I are going to tailor and customize our, whatever our product and service is to fit their needs. Do they want blue or do they want red? Do they want the deluxe model or the basic model? Do they want, uh, what's the color, shape, size, configuration? What's the make? What's the model? How do we need to customize and tailor whatever we do or offer to meet their needs? Can we do it? Uh, and can we do it in a way that meets their, that meets their needs, you know? So that PIMAT framework, P-I-M-A-T, problem, impact, money, authority, technical, seems to be kind of a scorecard that if you have those five conversations, hit those five topics during your needs analysis, you can get all the way through those and, and pretty much know once you're done with that conversation, I've got a golden prospect here. He scores high on all those five, mm -hmm. or I've got a crappy prospect he doesn't score very high on any of those and yeah. that'll tell us immediately how how many concerns or objections or issues or worries we're going to run into during our second meeting where now we're proposing and doing the demo and trying to close the sale etc so i don't know if that makes sense yeah well it really does i mean i, I think you're doing two things with with pymat one year you uh i you're identifying and qualifying, is this a good prospect? And you're yeah. also eliciting the objection of that prospect. One, one trick that I always try to use in sales is, when it comes to objections is just think about the stuff that, the objections that come up every time with this type of customer. And you can, if you've seen enough deals, you kind of know what, what the problems are. And if you're new to a role, you can ask the other reps like, hey, what are the sticking points here? Why do we lose deals? Where do the objections come up? And you just got to figure out what the 10 most common objections are and, and then, you know, kind of figure out how to overcome them and write that down in a, in a spreadsheet. And I, and I would advise a whole sales team to do this. You can kind of crowdsource this across. Oh, the sales team. oh yeah. Yeah. No but question. Then, and then once you've identified them, you bring up the ones that you think are going to come up with this prospect, you bring it up proactively on your own early in the process. And then, you show them after you've brought it up why it's not actually a problem. So if it's like, oh, you know, I know that I have a a competitor that is 20% cheaper, but not nearly as good. And so I want to bring that up, right? I want to say, you know, you might notice if you, as you do your research here on, on this space that we have this competitor that is 20% cheaper, but I'll, you know, in, in my presentation and during the demonstration, I'll show you what's different about us that provides so much more value to our customers and, and where you would get so much more value out of our, our solution than, than that service that the 20%, uh, there's a, the 20% cheaper is, is irrelevant. And, yeah. and you can do that with almost any objection where you, you know, identify what it is, bring it up and then show why it's, 
not a, a justified objection, like justified meaning why you shouldn't do the deal because of it. And it's so much easier if you're ahead of it and bringing it up rather than if they bring it up, then you almost have to prove to, you almost have to get, you're almost in an argument or a confrontation where you're proving them wrong. Whereas if you brought it up just on, you know, in the, in the course of conversation, then it's like, Oh, I, I don't Great. I was going to ask that anyway. And the, the prospects think, you know, I was going to ask that anyway. And no, I don't have to, you just do my job for me. Fantastic. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I, I don't know. It, it just seems like the times when I run into the most objections at the end, when I'm trying to close a sale, it's because I skimped or skipped one of these pie mat elements. I just, I, I kind of bounced over the top of it real quick Mm -hmm. And I, did, I wasn't as thorough and detailed with it, or I just skipped it all together. It'll yeah. always come back to bite me in the rear end. And yeah. so that's why over the years, I'm like, I can't skip steps. I got to stay true to my process. If I just stick to the recipe, it, it'll be smooth sailing at the end. Uh, yeah. But it doesn't always happen. And sometimes you do have to overcome and resolve some concerns and objections there. But, but I, I find like 85, 90% of the time, you can prevent them from causing you grief by just doing a great job during the needs analysis or mm -hmm. qualification stage with, with PyMap. So, anyway. yeah, well, I, I love the structure and I would encourage our listeners who are a part of a team to um, develop a structure like this or, you know, change it a little for your, for your organization if needed to, but, but do it consistently across your sales team. Cause it, there's a ton of research that giving your, giving a sales team kind of, these types of tools and then using them, applying them consistently across the sales organization. Absolutely. Really, really good results. And teams that do apply things consistently will, uh, will outperform teams that don't. No question. And, uh, you know, and speaking of which, we've actually developed a, what, what we just kind of lovingly referred to as a, a PIMAT scorecard. It's actually a form that after you have a sales call, uh, you can pull this up and just kind of, it's just kind of a self-evaluation. Did I do this? Did I do this? Did I do this? And, or, or how's the prospect here, 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 and here? And you can actually score that on a scale of one to 10. There's mm. five letters, five topics, and a score out of, you know, a zero to 10. 10 would be a perfect score. Total score of 50. You can score your prospects uh, on a scale of zero to 50. The closer mm -hmm. to 50 they are, that gives you as a salesperson you can say, this is like a massively awesome prospect, or this is kind of a wishy-washy mediocre, or this is a terrible prospect, just based on how they score on that PIMAT scorecard. So if any of your listeners happen to want one, they can email you, email me, happy to send that uh, PDF document to them as, uh, as my gift to them. So anyway. Very cool. Yeah, I, I used to do something very similar to this for qualification when I was a rep, and uh, I would do it in Excel. You know, today, you know, the world's matured. You could do this in your CRM. There's, yep. there's a, a lot of places that you, I mean, you could, and, and still you can do it on a piece of paper. <laughs> like it all yep. works, yep. right? Yep. Um, you know, the, but, but I think the, the point is to have a methodology that you're consistently applying. Yep. Um, and most don't. Most, most, most sales reps just, they, they just wing it. They shoot from the hip. They don't have like a system or a process or a methodology like you're saying. But man, does it make all the difference in the yeah. world and preventing objections. So anyway, good, good question. Well, tell me about, um, uh, why do you, why do you think some salespeople consistently close larger sales and others don't? And, and if you, uh, how can a salesperson that is having trouble closing larger deals identify what they should be doing better? Well, I, of course there's, I, I mean, it's like, it's like asking, uh, you know, why do people have heart attacks? Well, and some don't, it's like, well, there's a whole bunch of reasons, but I, I think overall, uh, if I had to narrow it down to like three factors, why some sales reps close sales, like really consistently tick, 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 their closing ratio is very high. I think, I think they've got three things that they do better than maybe average or core or just kind of run of the mill uh, sales reps. The first is, is they have an unusually great ability to diagnose organizational problems. That's kind of the P and the I in PyMap. They're amazing question askers. Their, their questioning skills are, are superb. They don't ask just any random question. They ask the right kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. So they've got a really an amazing ability to diagnose these three to five problems that an organization is dealing with. 
The second is, obviously this is an easy one, is, is they know their products inside and out. And that's pretty straightforward. The third, I think, is, is pretty tricky. This is, this is kind of where the rubber really meets the road. They, because they know these organizational problems that their prospects are dealing with, and they know their products really, really well, they, they have the ability to bridge a gap between those two by they have the ability to creatively solve complex business problems using the same old boring products that they have. They sell the same old boring stuff, but they do it in a very creative, innovative way that solves very complex problems for their clients. Uh, the best analogy or thing that I can think of is duct tape. Uh, I mean, like what do people do with duct tape? They fix shoes. They build, they make clothing and handbags out of them. They, you can like do anything with duct tape, right? It's a single product with 101 different uses. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you just do a search on Google for like, you know, uh, uh, ways to use duct tape and you look at the images, people are so flipping creative what they, what they use duct tape for. But that's how, that's, that's how good sales reps close consistently. They sell the same old boring piece of duct tape, but they're using it in tremendously creative and diverse ways mm. that solve uh, really complex problems for customers. And so they're not good at just using the duct tape to fix you, you know, something that's broken. They're using it very creatively. So that's a skill that I call sales intelligence, understanding the problems, understanding the product, but then, you know, uh, bridging that gap through their their creativity and innovation and uh, i think that's what they do better than than uh, average folks well fantastic terry the next step uh next section in the podcast today is sales in 60 seconds where i'll ask you a series okay. of questions and Great. and the goal is to to answer the questions as quickly as possible and you know in 60 All right. seconds ish so now do if i do it do i win like a consolation prize or anything special just just quickly. yeah I, i've got a uh, i've got a lovely badger maps mug here for you it's my i will take it i'm a huge I, fan I used, I used it myself but you know here okay. it is <laughs> so it's got a little ring around, then that will be, that's excellent. Perfect. <laughs> so, uh, so what can, what can a sales manager do this week to improve their sales team's performance? Um, don't focus on sales training. That might sound counterintuitive, but instead focus on clarifying the expectations that you have, the sales manager has of their sales rep. Uh, find, give them better quality feedback, observe them, give them feedback on their performance, give them uh, access to better tools and resources that will support and enable them to close sales. Um, take a look at your sales compensation plans. Look at your financial as well as your non-financial incentives, but also your consequences when they hit their marks. What do you do from a financial and a non-financial way to to, to compensate them, incentivize them. But if they don't, what are your consequences? What are the punishments uh, that come there? But also look at, look, uh, take a look at uh, their job description. Are they a good fit for that position? If you want to improve sales performance like fast, don't point your finger at sales training immediately. Point your finger in other areas that don't, don't require knowledge, learning, education, that sort of thing. Look at clarifying expectations, tools and resources, incentives, um, overall motivation, capacity, ability, skill development, even look at those things. All right. Um, what's a common mistake you see reps make when closing larger deals? Um, and of course, how can you avoid these mistakes? Common mistake is they put too much focus uh, and effort. They spend too much time in the sales process talking about their solution and their company and not enough time on, on mapping out and identifying what the core issues and challenges and problems are within the customer's organization and getting that three to five problems identified and understanding the true impacts of them that spend like 70% of your time on that 30% mm. of your time on the solution and then on why your company is awesome. That, uh, that, that really resonates with me. I, I, I worked for a company in the past that, we had like a set a set of slides, well, like most companies do. And like the first five were about us and why we were just the awesomest. Yeah. And like, as I, I would try to fly through the slides because I could see 
in the prospect's eyes, they just did not care. It's like, oh, these are our customers, and this is our stock price, and this is our. It's just like no one cares. Like no and, one cares. And, you know, and when I when I initially built the de the deck at Badger, um, it was like I focused it on here are the things changing for field salespeople. Here are the here's how the here's how the landscape is shifting, and here's what. You know, here's what tech, here's how technology is applying to that. And here's what mobility can do in that landscape. And here, yes, yeah, so it was, it was all about them yeah. and their problems and it resonated so much better. It works. Yep. Yeah, but some, sometimes that's the number one mistake that I think reps make is they just flip that the wrong way. They yeah. spent 70% of their time on uh, what my product is, its features and benefits, why my company is award-winning, triple awesome, state of the art best thing next to sliced bread. And then, oh, by the way, like, what do you need? What are some problems that you need? 30% yeah. on like right. that after, no, 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 no. Flip what those they? around, spend 70% of the time on them, their problems, the issues, 30% on your stuff and you'll do a great job. So Fantastic advice. So how do you gain the trust of your prospects when closing larger deals? Um, die, as goofy as it sounds, think of, think of going to the doctor, think of taking a long time in the diagnostic phase. Like I'm a huge fan of audits and assessments and evaluations and reviews and, and that sort of thing and getting all the stakeholders involved. Have them all do an assessment, an audit, an evaluation, some sort of something where you're learning and then share the results of that with all the stakeholders and then get all the stakeholders to be nodding their head, looking at each other going, yeah, you know what, this is a problem. This is the biggest issue we have as a company. When all the decision makers and all the stakeholders are nodding their head in agreement that these five problems are, are absolutely our top issues, and you haven't said one word yet about what you sell in essence or what, how awesome your company is, they trust you more than anything else because you're taking so much time and focusing on them. They feel like you're the most unselfish person in the world, that you're an expert, that you're a consultant, that you're a true authority in your industry because you're taking so much time focusing on what's important to them. You want to build trust with perfect strangers? Overdo it, if you will, uh, in the diagnosis phase. Get everybody on the same page, not head nodding around the core issues, then move to the solutions, then move to why your company is the best option. That'll build trust better than anything else as well as if you're into personality profiling and disc and in and, and adaptive selling adapting how you sell to different personalities that's of course kind of the second level but first level is get your process right and that'll do more to build trust better than anything so great so what advice do you have for salespeople who have a big deal that's been put on hold that's sliding sideways it's you know it's just not moving yeah um, that probably means that several steps in PIMAT were missed. If you've got a big deal and at the very end they said, well, we're going to put this on hold, that's an objection. And that probably means you missed some critical vital element of PIMAT. Mm. So you've got two options. You can move on and move on to another company and just consider it a, a dead deal and move on. Or you go back to the very beginning of PIMAT. The only way to resurrect that is to go back to PIMAT, Problem, Impact, Money, Authority, Technical, and, and go back through those steps and, and hope that that topic can be resurrected enough. Uh, but what I would probably recommend is let that sleeping dog lie and go on to a second problem. You should have identified five problems. Your solution may be focused on three. So go back to PIMAT and go focus on those other two. Like think about sale number two, put sale number one that just got put on hold on ice, leave it there. Go back to the beginning with them and start working on a different type of sale with them. Sale number two with PIMAT. So. Very cool. Um, super creative. So what's the number one habit sales reps can start implementing right now to start closing larger deals? Well, uh, as, as I mentioned, I think, uh, um, I, I love the book. It's a classic 1988 Neil Rackham spin selling. You won't find a better uh, qu a questioning framework uh, that sales reps can use to impact their, their closing ratio than, than that. 
Uh, we teach our own version of that. It's basically the same, some, some nuances. But if, if the number one habit to get into is asking about 10 times more uh, and 10 times better quality questions than you currently are earlier in the sales process. That'll, that'll directly impact your closing ratio by a factor of 10, no question. Well, these have been some fantastic answers. Um, what I'm going to try to do is I'll do my best to summarize this for everybody that's driving and everything. Yeah. Um, so first, uh, customized expectations are just across the board, something that salespeople need to pay more attention to. You can figure out what prospects are expecting out of a salesperson and what they are expecting out of a conversation. Customer expectations can be moldable, and as a salesperson, you should educate prospects and show them how you can meet their expectations. Yep. Try to understand where you can create value for a prospect and how you can shape their expectations so that they remain happy. Salespeople should pay attention to the warning signs that a prospect might not close. So first, prospects keep cutting you off. Prospects don't let you explain and share your solution's value. Two, the degree of openness of the prospects. Prospects should be open to sharing more about their company and what their true pain points are. Three, access to decision makers. Be alert to how much access they have to other decision makers in the company and try to talk with as many decision makers as possible. If the prospect is cutting you off or keeping you in the dark in any way, the prospect is a lot less likely to close. Um, what you can do is use the PIMAT system to get through buyer objections. Once again, PIMAT stands for problem, impact, money, authority, and technical. So let's go over how to use this system real quick. Problem, practice, practice asking prospects questions to identify three to five problems the company is having so that you can provide solutions. Map your solution to those problems. If you can't identify at least three problems there at the company, then you might have a problem uh, closing the deal down the line. Impact. Figure out the impact of each of these problems. Dig deeper with additional questions to figure out how big are these problems for the, for the company? What are the results if these problems aren't solved in terms of the company damage to the company's bottom line or maybe even political damage or personal damage to the buyer or decision maker? p and I are really, so problem and impact are really the big motivators. Understanding these and really getting to the heart of them will cut objections by around 60%. Next, we come to money. Figure out how much money the company is willing to spend. Then there's authority. Understand the decision makers involved and the prospects processes around making decisions within their company. Technical. How should salespeople customize their solution to fit their prospects needs? You got to make sure that you're, you're not jamming a square peg in a round hole. You've got to round your peg first before you put it in. And a lot of so many solutions today are so customizable um, and have been built that way that you, you want to really make sure you're, you're right sizing and, and fitting the right slice of your solution or fitting the uh, configuring yourself appropriately for their needs. And a lot of times it's the same solution over and over again. It's just the way it's presented. And we, we run into that all the time, right? Like we'll have field salespeople using this and then we'll have like a trucking company using it and like they use it in totally different ways, but it's the same underlying software, right? I mean, we, we focus on the salespeople side, but there's a bunch of random uses for mapping software. I, I run into this. I run, I mean, uh, this is tangential, but I mean, I run into this all the time that we, just, we, have to use the right, we have to use the right words. You have to position it right. We set it up a little bit differently. They're using it for different things. It's the same technology, but they, they feel like they're getting like a customized solution. Um, when really it's, you know, we're just setting it up a little differently. We've built it to be customized and a lot of today, you know, because technology is flexible, that's how it works. So the, the, the PIMAT system, remember that it's a scorecard to see how likely your prospect is to close. Using a system like this will help salespeople gain better results. Uh, it'll, it'll help them 
get ahead of buyer objections and it'll help those salespeople close larger deals. Yep. So certain salespeople, certain salespeople close larger deals, more consistency because for several reasons, one, they ask the right questions and identify the key problems an organization is dealing with Two, They really know their product inside and out. And that that's kind of table stakes. Three, they use this knowledge um, to map their prospects problems to the product that they sell in a creative way. And that's what really differentiates, you know, the, the rock star salespeople. Um, Terry calls this sales intelligence selling in a different and innovative way to help salespeople close larger deals. Fantastic. Um, fantastic. Yeah. Five stars. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you, you, those, you, you really dropped some wisdom for us today. Tell me where can listeners read more about you and your work or reach out to you? I, I know you do sales training and sales coaching, but you, yeah. you really specialize in sales performance improvement, assessing the overall sales performance of an organization, identifying opportunities for improving sales results, things that usually have to do with like feedback and tools and resources, hiring great salespeople, uh, tweaking job descriptions, figuring out incentives and motivation, compensation plans, working with the CRM and, and mapping that to, to be successful, scripts, et cetera. The, the blocking and tackling here. What, where, where can people learn more about what you do? Uh, well, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, of course, e- easy to connect with me on LinkedIn. That's probably the number one place that I'd recommend from there. Easy for us to, uh, you can see lots of different content and information there. Certainly, um, you can go to our website. That's uh, hansengroupcompany.com. We'll provide some additional links. Um, uh, but if anybody would like to have that, that PIMAT scorecard, they can email me or you and, uh, and happy to send that to them as my gift. But uh, but also because I'm such a fan of, uh, of helping organizations improve their overall sales performance, uh, sales training, again, is just a small piece of, of what we know helps move the needle there. Uh, but 85% of the time, if you want to increase sales performance, it's, it's, it's related to things outside of training, knowledge, education. And so because of that, uh, my gift, my early Christmas gift to, uh, to all of your listeners, I'll provide a link that they can use to go through a, a pretty bumper to bumper comprehensive uh, sales organizational uh, assessment uh, that'll show them exactly where their strong um, average and, and, uh, and weak areas are that they can start working on to, to really make some changes in, in sales revenue. So I'll provide some links down there, but, uh, um, but yeah, hopefully that helps your team. Yeah, definitely, definitely worth checking out. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed this episode of the Outside Sales Talk. If you have any feedback or any suggestions, just reach out to me at feedback at outsidesalestalk.com. If you like the podcast, subscribe to it, leave a review, helps us spread the word and get more outside salespeople like you to find out about us. So take care until next week. 